welcome to Two Women Chatting with Liz and Michelle. Enjoying life in our 50s, we're also empty nesters, looking to reinvent, reset, have fun and talk about topics with experts and friends that affect us, our kids and our families. So grab a cuppa and join us on the sofa for a chat. There's always room for one more. We're not tech savvy, but we do our best. But it's a learning curve. All bumps, clicks and noises are our own. Come on in and have a seat. believe it do you know how many podcasts fail and never go past five episodes and we've doubled it we're at 10 and we're heading for our season finale when is our finale oh uh, when we when we get around to recording it but no that's really good and guess how many countries we're now downloaded in go on tell me 34 34 honestly 34 yeah, I think that's I amazing. Impressed. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening in and um, following and subscribing. We'd still really, really like to hear from you because that shapes what we do. If we're talking about the subjects that you're interested in and we're interested in, um, it makes a better show. So please email us if you want to at twowomenchatting at gmail.com. Correct. Yeah. No, it is. We want to know what people want to talk about. Because, yeah, we know what we want to talk about, but not necessarily what other people want to talk about. Yeah, well, listen. yeah, probably got some really fascinating subjects that we haven't even thought of. But I must say, you know, we're already planning for the rest of the year and we've got yeah. fascinating things to talk about. Well, but, let's talk about your holiday. Yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Yeah, I know. Okay, so I was it's it's not business. Not business no, at, it's all. Not business at all. Well, it's forward. I've seen the pictures. <laughs> But I was seeing my daughter who just moved. On the beach? Well, yes, that's how we caught up and it was really nice. So whilst you were in Florida, did mm -hmm. you manage? Did you manage to keep to that regime? I did. I was mostly, that's a, a common word, isn't it, in my vocabulary. <laughs> I was mostly very good, but I was. But what I did do was some exercise and you'll laugh at this because for the very first time I went back to, um, you know, like organised structured gym classes and I knew I'd found my 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 place yeah. because I ended up in a step class and instead of like Britney vibes, I was doing it to Barry Manilow's Copacabana <laughs> oh, with about six seventy year olds. And I could almost it's catch up. Almost keep up. <laughs> But it was funny because I'd actually um, I'd actually signed up for the core <laughs> class so I could lay on the floor. But yeah. <laughs> that's I my type of exercise. Into you know. step yeah. instead. Oh my god! Had to rely on a bit of muscle memory from years ago. Yeah. But no, that yeah, felt good. good. Was mm -hmm. that just one song though? Well, I, we were ten minutes into the class and I looked at the clock and I, oh my god, how am I going to do another fifty minutes of this? That's oh, the problem if you sign up for those. You I can't know. you can't leave. I was practically on oxygen by about halfway through. <laughs> Oh, but then you went to the beach afterwards. Well, yeah. So um, I went out there to catch up with my daughter, Flissy, who's just moved. Um, and she's now living in this really gorgeous area in West Palm Beach. And went across to Palm Beach, saw Trump's Mar-a-Lago. How dated an 80s is that place, honestly? <laughs> but that was that was interesting. But um, she's looking for a job at the moment. And she's had some interviews and stuff. And it's going pretty well. But I tell you what really scared me. And this was when she was living back in California. She applied for a job and it was in Miami because she'd always fancied moving across to the other coast. And it was for a marketing agency. So I said, oh, that's really great. That's really great. She got the interview. She did, um, you know, like a Zoom interview and they invited her back for another one. So she's like, oh, mom, this is really great. It went so wonderfully. And this company, they say that, um, you know, they'll give you training. And after six months, you can go anywhere in the world you want. I said, what do you mean anywhere in the world you want? Well, they've got these marketing branches everywhere. And if they haven't got one, then you can set up an office. I said, wow, that okay. sounds incredible. With more experience and that sounds really, really good, yeah. Flissy. You know, should we just check into this company a bit? So I go online and I look up this company, and I won't mention the name, although in some ways I should. It's a marketing company, okay? On Instagram, they've got 80 followers. Ding, 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 ding. Mm. On their website, they've got typos. Ding, yeah, ding, 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 ding. Yeah. And their hyperlinks are not working. I mean, what kind of marketing company would have links to Facebook and Instagram and this, that and the other, and it doesn't work? So already I'm thinking, mm, my spidey sense says this is not right. 
And I said to Flissy, well, what did you do? And she said, well, they were going to invite me over for an interview face to face in Miami. And I said, OK, well, uh, just, let's just hold on a little bit here. So I know I'm a bit of a helicopter parent, but sometimes I think you have to know when it's to just check it just, out. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. So I phoned them. I wasn't going to say, oh, my daughter's interviewing for you or anything. <laughs> it's a bit no, much, yeah. I phoned them just to get a vibe. It went to a standard Verizon, which is a, a telephone company in in the state. Standard, sorry, we can't answer your call right now. Please leave a message and we'll get back to you. And I'm like... There is no marketing agency in the world that would just have your bog standard. Automated. Concept. Yeah. No. Yeah. And then I talked to my husband about it and he said, well, you know, you know, some of these can be fronts for sex trafficking. <gasps> yeah, seriously. Oh my God. Can you imagine the pit of my stomach? I felt sick, sick, sick. And I said, Felicity, don't do it. I don't care what it is. Just don't go for this company. But what it did, it reminded me that several years ago, before pandemic, I'd been to this lunch and some women there had showed me this outstanding video by a charity called You Can Free Us Foundation. It's like 90 seconds long. I think it's black and white, actually. But my God, it hit you in the gut. It made you realize that slavery, trafficking, all so these so things. Modern slavery. Modern slavery can be really like on our doorstep, wherever we live. It's not just, you know, in third world countries. It can be in New York, in Chicago. In fact, there's been a lot of cases recently and definitely in the UK. So I got in touch with this lady, Clarissa Drysdale Anderson, who's the UK president of You Can Free Us Foundation. And I just thought maybe we should ask her a few questions because with our girls going out into the marketplace, into the workplace now, I just want to know what should they be looking out for and how can we you know, just be a bit more aware of this situation. I think, I think the problem is that there's so much on the internet and it, it hides stuff. It yeah, it yeah. pulls you in and you don't even realise you're being well, scammed. Well, just if you're a young person, well, any, we all get taken in by it. But, you know, you're looking for a job, you're, you're a little bit, sometimes naive, that's a bit unfair, but you're also desperate to get a job. We are naive because right you don't have experience, no, you don't. do you? I mean, you know, I'm internet naive as well. I, I, you know, I log into stuff that I really shouldn't. Well, that sounds really bad, but yeah, you know, yeah. but you know, cause I don't, and then I download something and I realize I shouldn't, but you know, I think there's, there's so much out there that, that people need to be aware that that's where it starts from. Mm. All right. Well, let's have a chat with Clarissa then. Okay. So Clarissa, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Clarissa Drysdale Anderson from You Can Free Us Foundation. So Liz and I, we've got a lot of questions really. Um, I was just relating to to Liz about a sticky situation my own daughter found herself in applying for a job in Miami, which turned out to be a complete scam. And uh, it was when I was experiencing that with her that, I mean, literally my stomach flips still thinking about it, what could have, what could have happened. Um, but I guess we really want to know a bit more about what's happening, the statistics. It's happening not just far away. It's happening on our doorstep, isn't it, modern slavery? So would you take a minute and just introduce yourself and the foundation and um, take it from there? Sure, sure. So I'm uh, Clarissa, as uh, Michelle has said. I've been working in this uh, field for about 12 years now, Michelle. And I think the interesting thing to say is that when you look 12 years ago, people actually had no idea of what modern slavery is. You know, they, they just had no idea. And even the terminology modern slavery w was just not known. So it's a very different situation now where the media has highlighted quite a bit. So there is awareness. But even though people kind of understand what modern slavery is, they just do not know how terrible it, you know, it can be and how you mentioned it can sometimes affect us directly. So I think the most important thing is perhaps for the people who are listening to this podcast today to understand that it, it is not something that is just happening in remote parts of the world, in emerging economies uh, with poor kids, but it's actually now happening in uh, in our society, in every postcode of the world, we hear of this problem, and it is a growing problem. It is a growing problem. So I think that's probably what makes this conversation so relevant here today. Why is it growing? Why are we not able to stamp it out more? Yeah, it's growing mainly because it is a problem of vulnerability. 
So there are many causes. So whenever there is poverty, whenever there is vulnerability of any kind, and poverty is just one of them, that's why we tend to believe that it only happens in poor communities. But whenever there is any, any issue of uh, vulnerability, that's when uh, modern slavery can strike. So whether it's a kid running away from home, where, where is a is a family is struggling to feed, you know, their their children and is forced to either sell one of them or is or is tempted to believe that there is something out there better for one of their kids, whether it's a job opportunity, whether it's just someone who says they will look after that child. So whatever the situation of vulnerability is, that's actually when modern slavery strikes. And that's when we see uh, in those trigger points, whether it's a teenager looking for an opportunity to work abroad, whether it's an Eastern European uh, girl trying to flee a situation of war, as we see now, uh, or a mother and a child crossing the border without the man to accompany them because the man had to stay behind fighting mm. the war. So again, that's why we see it, it, it growing. Or whether it's a pandemic like the COVID-19 that have, you know, has hit the world and taken the world by surprise for over two years. Again, you know, vulnerability and economic struggles. And that's what puts, uh, put pressures on, uh, on the people who are behind this. And I think it's important for the people who are listening to understand that this is a organized crime. So we're talking about one of the most profitable industries in the world, as profitable as drug dealing, as professionalized as weapon dealing. So it is very profitable. We're talking about 150 billion of annual profits annually. Oh so it is, it is, and we're talking about 40 million people. You know, perhaps I'll just throw some statistics out there because I think sometimes people don't understand how big the problem 40 is. 40 million people and are currently in slavery 40 million and again this number is conservative because how do you really know how many people are actually in slavery right so there's a uh, there's a conservative estimates conservative numbers may, based on people who have already been free on where we have been able to detect the problem mm. right so 40 million in the uk alone we're talking about 150 thousand which for a country with the resources, the law enforcement, the awareness, I think is shocking. It's frightening. And again, comparative to the population, it is frightening. Um, and again, I think there, the, there, is, there are solutions, there are ways of dealing with this. And across the world, people are dealing with it in different ways, in strengthening the laws, in strengthening law enforcement, raising awareness, uh, but it's it's not enough mm. because the numbers are just too uh, too great now. And again, it is uh, widespread as we started talking this program. It's in every country, it's in every city. It's almost I think I dare to say that it's almost in every postcode. You know, as, what, as in, we discussed. In UK, now. would you say? In the UK, for sure, is on our that uh, on our doorstep. It's in every postcode. It is, uh, it's just that it's an invisible crime. It's hidden in plain sight because it also takes many forms. It's not just the, you know, people tend to, to think of slavery as, as the pictures of slaves mm -hmm. that we, mm -hmm. now that we are, we, we unfortunately had to hear through history of the, the slavery uh, the transatlantic slave uh, trade, and it's it's very yeah. different. It's today. the girl it's, that's in the nail salon. The modern it's the it's the fisherman the who doesn't get off a boat for years. Or it's the man in the in the car wash. Yeah. It's the young yeah. man in the car wash. But it can also be the girl in the pop up brothel just down the corner. You know, it can be domestic violence of different types. You know, where it's any situation where you do not have your free will and you're being exploited mm -hmm. uh, many times for commercial purposes, uh, but not only for commercial purposes. So is any time a person is is uh, is restrained from its rights to go and come back um, and is, you know, mistreated in any way, this can be considered a situation of uh, of slavery. Mm -hmm. It's and it's um, it's important to know it's not just women, is it? It's young men as well being taken into slavery. It is, but situations. I think it's it's important to say that it's over eighty percent, uh, close to ninety percent actually, are women. 
So it is a crime that is very focused on women and children. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think, yes, the young men are vulnerable, but young women are even more vulnerable. And the numbers show across the world, across the board, that it is mainly a crime against women and children. So, I mean, we were talking about some of the numbers in terms of children. I think it's shocking that there are 150 million children trapped in child labor. So one in every four of the victims we're talking about are actually a child on some sort of, you know, um, type of modern slavery. could be child labor of some sort. It could be sex trafficking. Uh, It could be child marriage, which, again, is another one that is not perhaps not so close to kind of our society here. But it does happen a lot in other types of societies and, again, is one of the forms of child labor there is the organ trafficking which is a horrendous oh gosh, form of... i can barely even <laughs> i know it's awful just to turn up a... it's not turning a blind eye but it's just so horrific you can barely think about it it's awful it, it is common. it is it and is common, I, think, isn't it? I think the main problem when i talk about numbers and i i think you know there is a reason i think people need to understand how big how widespread how complex it is uh, and that's why it's worth, you know, talking about it over and over again. But again, the problem with that is that sometimes people can get overwhelmed, you know, Michelle and Liz, they, and they feel like, oh, this is just way too big and there's nothing I can do and almost feel like a little bit detached mm. from uh, this right. situation. Right. It's like if it's so big, what can little old me do to, to change that's anything? That's right. Will I even make mm. a difference? That's one problem. The other problem you touched slightly on is, is that it's just like so dark and so horrible that it's even hard to talk about it. And then some people also tend to shut, you know, and not want to discuss it. However, I like every time I give a talk and uh, about this, this topic, I like to say that it is also a story of hope and light Because especially through the work of the foundation that I have been doing for now 12 years, we see the other side of the coin. We see that there is hope. We love to say that we at You Can Free Us, we're in the business of rewriting life stories and that every life story can be rewritten. And I absolutely love Mm. that because it is true. And uh, we've seen a lot of transformation in, in people's lives. So I think if it is the if there is the dark side of it, and we can maybe talk a little bit about some of the stories and some of the realities, there is also the, the other side where a person can be fully restored and start fresh mm-hmm. again. And it can only happen, you know, because of the work of many organizations out there, many people who actually decide to take a stand decided to do something to act upon this problem. So tell us a bit more about your foundation then. So when did it start? So it started uh, 12 years ago in India in 2010. Um, And it started very much from a reality. So I lived in India, I forgot to say that. So I lived in India for six years. So um, I was there since 2007. So again, many years ago. Um, and this started about two to three years since I, I had started living there. So I could see situations, I could hear situations of women exploitation, of children disappearing in the community, in the community. Um, and that bothered me, yeah. as it bothered many of us who were living there. I had never seen a reality so close to me. And at that point, as we discussed, it was not something that was that we had podcasts or TV programs or or newspaper articles being written about this topic. It was very much almost like a taboo topic oh, where really? people didn't really mention mm. so much. Yeah, especially in India, it was not something people would discuss. So, you know, back 12 years ago, people really wouldn't talk about this. So I think as, as you know, I started living there and building a network, I think there was a growing sense of, you know, what can I do with what I have in my hands? And I think that's always a starting point for anyone. You know, once you're faced with a problem or a challenge, I think it's almost like you've given the opportunity to see that problem. I'm sure you've been given also the responsibility to act upon that. There must be something, Mm -hmm. you know, it's almost like a privilege to be faced with a problem because then there is always something in your hands that you can Mm -hmm. do. 
and if you don't, you will regret. So I think that's the beauty of thing, you know, uh, of things, you know. So at that point, what I had in my hands, I had a little bit of knowledge of that country. I was already living there for three years, but I had a network in place in different areas. I had a lot of connections through my husband's work, through my own work, through the school, etc. business connections. And I thought there must be something we can do. So I met the founder um, uh, who is a guy called Sujo John. He is the, the main founder of You Can Free Us. He is an American of Indian origin. And at that point in time, he had just started raising resources and uh, putting together uh, a plan to open the first safe house for women and children. And I, that's when I joined the leadership team because I was actually on the ground. And through a network of people, we were able to raise enough funds to set up the, the first uh, safe house and uh, put the licenses in place. It's quite a complex thing. So it's not something that you can do easily. Now, it took many months and a lot of uh, research and work to be able to to put together. And I think one important thing that we did at that point in time, and that was already 2012, uh, was to do a big event to raise awareness through the fashion world. Ah. And I think the voices of society are very important. So whether you're talking about arts or you're talking about business leaders or you're talking about fashion, I mean, there are so many voices of society that can really make a difference you know, when they take a stand against a certain situation. So that's what happened in, at that point in time. We, we were able to do a, a very large event at the Indian Fashion Week in 2012, where a lot of the main fashion designers, you know, of that Asian uh, region of the world took a stand against this problem. And it was noticed by the media and the media picked up. And that's kind of, I, I would love, I mean, I believe that, um, we sort of were able to open the debate. Remember, I started by saying that it was a little bit of a taboo. So after that event and with the, the you know, the help of the media, I think we were able to open the debate mm -hmm. against uh, modern slavery and uh, sex trafficking in India at that point in time. And that's how it developed. So then you fast forward 12 years and now we are in a few other countries. We're here in the UK. We're in the US, Canada, Norway. We had an operation for many years in Eastern Europe. Um, and we are not only on the victim care side, which is basically running safe houses and helping victims, um, but we are also in the prevention side, which I think is a big thing. Raising awareness, educating, uh, and re really helping the problem before it even starts, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that's um, that's kind of a, another important side so of do it. Do you work? Um, I've read that um, like airline companies and things like that are training their staff to look out for uh, young women who maybe what they don't speak much. They're not allowed to speak for themselves on on flights. They might look a little dirty. Just generally, there's all sorts of training, isn't there? Do you ever collaborate or work? on training with these much larger um, conglomerates and companies? Yes, we have. So uh, the awareness side of the work has many fronts. So one of them is, of course, the business side of it. So it's training corporations. And we have hosted uh, a few business conferences regarding modern slavery in supply chains in different industries, which is a, a, a big topic now, especially because it's linked to the overall topic of sustainability. You know? So it's the big thing under the S, the social aspect of sustainability, is modern slavery and supply chain. So we've done quite a bit of training there. We have also worked with businesses regarding CSR, so corporate social responsibility programs, mm -hmm. where they can actually engage with organizations that deal with this problem now. So that's another way um, of training organizations and employees on this topic. And I think I see a growing interest from businesses in the area. I think area. they have to be seen to be doing more ethical programs, don't they? And using their money wisely and recognizing sort of the underbelly of, uh, of a lot of things that are going on. So it's good PR for them, but ultimately PR, it's good for the anti-slavery yeah. campaign. PR, a few years ago, I think it was more PR, but I think now... It's changing actually believing in it. This is my, my, my thoughts yeah. on it, that, that they are changing. It, it, before it was a bit, they want we to just make do a it difference. greenwashing is what I'd like to call it. But now I think. Yeah, now it is very important because, as I said, it is 
it has come under one of the pillars of ESG, yeah. the Environmental, Social and Governance, which is the basically uh, uh, pillars. The, these are the basic pillars of sustainability. And I think no businesses today can survive without actually making their modern slavery statement very clear, make it very clear to the public. So brands that are not very clear on their stand regarding modern mm. slavery will not survive. And that's kind of a, something that has started and is just growing. That's why it's so important for businesses to to take that and then be very clear where they stand on I that. I think a lot of the, the younger generation as well are starting to uh, stand up and take notice of this, aren't they? And they're looking for these ethical yeah. um, badges of honor, if you like, on on the products and um, you know slow fashion that they might choose to to buy and so on. So um, how how do you market yourself? How do you you know who do you talk to? Is it is it uh, corporates or is it um, middle class women at a lunch or is it do you get into the schools as well? What's your avenues? Well, I think all of the above. I have to say, and the reason why is I don't think this needs the collaboration of mm-hmm. everyone. You know, it is such a complex problem that one nonprofit will not solve it alone or the government will not solve it alone or one business will not solve it alone. So it's about collaboration of the private sector, non-governmental agencies and individuals like you and me. And when we talk about individuals, again, is about reaching out to many types of individuals and each one will have a specific contribution and something they can do in their area of influence. So yes, we do talks to, as you said, to a lot of women, you know, and lunch talks we do, uh, we talk to corporations in conferences or do, or do specific training on modern slavery. We also talk in schools, you know, and that's, I think, uh, you, you, you started mentioning about uh, the young people. The young people, they are the justice generation. And this is one of the topics that, you know, will really grab the attention of the young people, you know, from the age of 12, 13, all the way to, you know, their university years. So that is, and that's the generation that can actually change this problem. So I like to say, I don't think uh, modern slavery will finish in our generation, but I really believe it can finish in their generation. So that's that group, Mm -hmm. you know, that is coming out. For many reasons, they are much more aware of this topic. They really will not tolerate it. You know, as you said, they're going for ethical brands. They're very interested in this topic. And they are the ones who will be sitting in positions that will actually make a difference in in governments and in organizations Mm -hmm. in the future. So that's why it's so important to educate young people. Uh, We have launched a program um, called Libertas which is targeting specific the young people. So at the moment, it is in the shape of a book, which is not the most attractive uh, way to reach out to young people, but it is written in a language for the young people. So I like to say that it's probably one of the most uh, compelling and uh, comprehensive works written for the youth on all aspects of modern slavery. So the target age is sort of 14 to 18 of this particular book, which then will become an ebook, which then will become a digital interactive platform. So that's kind of the long-term vision. So what do we do with this book? Basically, we use that as a, as a resource uh, for, as a reference resource for young people in schools. So we do different talks across you know, schools. And now we're trying to partner with businesses to see if we can raise funds, enough funds to transform the content into videos, you know, two, three minute, very straight to the point videos, because we know that's what grabbed the attention yeah. of young people. Now, and uh, can I yeah. ask you, I yeah. saw a video that you had produced, oh, maybe two or three years ago. And that's how I first um, learned of your foundation. It was, it was Literally almost Oscar worthy. Do you know the one I'm talking about? I, I think it's the short film yes. we produced called Switch. Switch. Yeah. Where can Switch. people watch that? Because that was, oh my gosh, to, to see yeah, that, that was, film. That was very interesting. There was, uh, we produced that in the end of 2019. We haven't had the opportunity to market as much because then the pandemic mm. came and, you know, so it is online and we do promote it in some of the events that we do. 
Um, it's only 90 seconds, but it's, it's powerful. very, very, um, yeah, it's very powerful. So it, you, you can just go on YouTube and then you can Google, you can free us switch. Okay. That's the name of the, we'll pop the a link on our Instagram program. as well so that people so can that find it. Yeah. Do. So I, yeah. It, it's worth watching. And again, some people might look at it initially and say, oh, it was filmed in India and think it might not relate to them. But every time I present that film, I like to say it was filmed in India, but it could have been done in Piccadilly Circus. Mm. It was it was in a busy street, a street of uh, Mumbai. That's where we filmed it. But it could have been equally the same, you know, in Piccadilly Circus. And the message would have been the same because the problem is the same. Um, and I think the impact would have been the mm. same, you know, so you can just watch the film. And if you're sitting in a different part of the world, you just imagine that that is okay, actually yeah. happening in the busy street in your town and it will be as relevant. Can I bring you on to something that's extremely topical right now? And that, of course, is Ukraine. And you you literally mm -hmm. had boots on the ground there, didn't you? Can you tell us a bit about yeah. how that was? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the how it started, maybe I should just say, because some people might say, why? Because it wasn't me. Uh, I mean, I went there, but it was with the foundation. You know? So I think, again, it's we saw all those horrible scenes on television at the start of the war, all those refugees trying to cross uh, the border, mainly women and children, as mm. we've already mentioned. And again, was a question of, first, what can we do to respond to the problem with what we have in our hands? And a lot of people started doing different things. There were people even driving trucks from the UK all the way to the border with uh, uh, supplies. So people were doing what they could. Uh, so again, what, what we could do was actually something great that we had in our hands because we had had an operation for over seven years in Eastern Europe, Romania and Poland. So we had a whole network just there on the border of Ukraine of people willing to help. So that was the first thing that sort of caught our attention when we decided to see how we could respond. And the second thing uh, was that I don't know if I mentioned this, and some people might not have realized this yet, but there is a great link between refugees and modern slavery. So a lot of the refugees uh, have experienced some sort of um, approach by traffickers doing their crossing, whether they're crossing the channel, whether they're traveling by plane, girls in planes, airports, uh, bus stations, train stations. Whenever there is flow of people, there is always, you know, intersection by traffickers at one point. So again, we started by saying that modern slavery is a crime of vulnerability. You can just imagine mm -hmm. a huge number of women and children crossing the border without the man and traffickers just posing, you know, at the border, just waiting, just preying on these women and children and posing as someone who could actually help and support them. And when you're desperate fleeing from war, you tend to believe that whoever yeah. is there is actually someone trying to help you. And in many of the cases, it was not. So we saw from uh, a lot of partner organizations and from governments that the number of uh, uh, the number of trafficking victims was just rising just in the beginning of the war and in the weeks that followed it. And it was a lot of the Ukrainian women and children. So we saw immediately that there was something that we could do. And at that point, it was not just awareness. So it wasn't enough to just tell the women, hey, don't get in the car with whoever. No, don't accept they're desperate. Food. You know, it, they're desperate. So there was a component of supplying the needs when they need at the time they need whatever they need. You know, it's mm. about supplying the needs to cut down on the vulnerability, which is the main cause of modern slavery. So what we decided to do was that uh, we raised some funds and we actually relocated some of our funds uh, to this uh, uh, Compassion Ukraine campaign that we launched in the beginning of the war, so about two months ago. And we, uh, we were able to procure a lot of the goods, a lot of the supplies that were needed right there in Romania and in uh, southern Romania. Uh, and we were able to cross with trucks full of um, medical supplies, especially some critical supplies like insulin and a lot of non-perishable food. Uh, across to Odessa. So why Odessa, some people asked. Uh, we also had a, a network there in place from many years ago. Um, 
So those were people that were in desperate need. So it was a group of 600 to 1,000 people sheltering. A lot of young people, a lot of disabled, a lot of uh, um, very elderly people and very young people who could not cross the border or decided not to. It also, border crossing is not for everyone. <laughs> so not everyone has the capability to actually walk kilometers and, and cross or just arrive at a place and not knowing anybody, not knowing what to do. So we decided to help them where they were. So we drove the trucks with all the, the, the food and all the medication there. And we've been supplying them, you know, for the last two months with what we have been able to raise. Uh, the third thing that we did was the generators because the power is on and off in some of those regions. So it was important to have small generations to keep, you know, electricity going. So those are the three things, the, the non-perishable food, the medication, and the generators. And now we're also helping a community of Ukrainians that have crossed the border, but not all the way to Western countries, but just there to the Moldova uh, border. So they're sitting in all those camps around Kisinau, the capital of Moldova. So there are about 500 refugees there that we're directly helping. And I think this had like an incredible impact and people were just amazed, people who donated and helped us with that campaign because it was such a direct impact and such a direct correlation between the money that people donated mm -hmm. and the immediate fruit that could be seen. Literally, the money arrived. I was there on the border. We bought everything. We loaded the trucks. The trucks crossed. So we established very quickly, you know, those supply chain uh to be able to, with all the licenses, all the permits, to quickly deliver what was needed. And I think the second thing was that it was not just the, the speed that the things were procured and delivered, but also we delivered what they needed. A lot of the things that were crossing the border were things that they not necessarily wanted or, or needed it. So this was like, we received the list rice, potatoes, beans, cans, you know, like very specific uh, things that they needed and the medication as well. Like we had almost close to 100 people, diabetics, including children and elderly people. What do you do if you don't have insulin? Mm -hmm. I mean, you die. That's a, that's a really, you know, life or death type of uh, medication. So we were able to procure the, uh, all the insulin and then take it uh, across the border. So that's why it was such a, a fast but also efficient way to supply the needs of uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees where they were and very close to the border as well. And I guess that's preventing them falling into the hands of the uh, traffickers. If they're able to stay in a particular place, they're not going to be crossing the borders, mm -hmm. which means they're not being exposed. That's right, because now the numbers are already over 5 million refugees uh, that have crossed the border, plus the ones which are displaced uh, internally in Ukraine. So I don't think we have seen a crisis like this since, you know, the Second no. World War. And that's why I think it was so close to home that, and so yeah. close to our reality yeah. that people also decided. But, yes, yeah, so we believe that, like you said, by, by supplying what they needed at the time they needed, we're also cutting on vulnerability and therefore yeah. cutting on, you know, the modern slavery potential. It's now that five million million people oh, yeah. that's... That, hmm. Without getting too political, um, you know, lots of people in the UK have like, oh, gosh, the, the UK government has put all these visa stipulations in place. It's preventing people from coming over quickly when they really need to. But from an anti-slavery point of view and yeah, um, vulnerability, do you think some of those are good or do you think they could have been trimmed back? You know, we all, we all want to help, and there's always that early rush, isn't there? The early rush of let's do everything, and then sort of there'll be a, a fade out. But um, the homes for Ukrainians, what is the foundation's feeling on safety as they come into this country or any other country that is looking to, to house families? Well, I think the way the UK is doing, I mean, there are two sides to it. In one way, it's quite strict because there are verifications of every family that will be receiving the, the refugees. There is a program in place that is well structured. But then, of course, to put that in place, it takes mm. longer. So that's why, you know, there are not so many uh, Ukrainians be able to get their, their uh, visas and come into the country as quickly as, as, as we wish. But on the other hand, there is more protection in place. 
We have seen a lot of other countries. They are basically just opening the borders and a lot of the refugees are coming in and they, they don't have a place to stay. And then they're staying in train stations. They're staying in bus stations. They're staying in anyone's houses without any further checks because there is really no, no visa that is needed. Um, so I think... It is in a way, I think it's better the way it's done in the UK, although it's taking longer. But I think from the perspective of protection, it's safer for them to come here because a lot of the stories, like I said, you know, they are going to countries where there are less checks and then they end up in houses of traffickers. And then these children are disappearing and these women are being exploited. So I think I, I sort of support uh, the current policies, careful. even though even yeah. though you know, they might delay a little bit of the process. And we know a lot of the families that have actually ha asked for help for us to intermediate some of the families that might be, you know, you know, wanting to come here and actually do a direct presentation instead of them just waiting uh, on the government portals to find the, the match, you know, the correct mm. match for their family. Mm. To come. Well, you've, I mean, the foundation has done incredible work. You must have... I mean, you see the dark side, obviously, and as you said earlier, you you know that there's hope. Tell us a couple of the stories that have really hit home for you, where you have you've met. I mean, you're clearly a force of nature. <laughs> I wouldn't cross you. <laughs> I know you'd have me agreeing to anything, oh, but I mean, tell me, tell us about you know maybe a couple of girls that you know that you have helped and yeah, set straight. I yeah, well, I think in 12 years, you could imagine there be there were hundreds of girls yeah. <laughs> that I've met. And I make a point, because I've lived in India, I make a point that even though I, I'm now here in the UK and I've been living here now for seven years, I always go back twice or three times a year to meet the new survivors and actually to know what they're going through so I can come back and tell the story because not everybody will get on a plane and go there and visit a survivor. Um, so sometimes they, I am the only way that they will hear the stories now. So I, I, I really like to engage directly with them, but we've had some really dark stories of, uh, of women who were trapped. There is one particular girl that always comes to my mind and she was trapped in a basement for nine years and she did not see the sunlight <laughs> for nine years. And then finally she was, um, rescued by the foundation together with uh, police enforcement. And uh, you can just imagine the trauma and how careful we had to be to deal with a situation like this. But then again, life story that can be rewritten and it was rewritten. You fast forward a few years. This girl now uh, works as a chef in a five-star hotel in Mumbai. She has a solid job. Uh, she has friends, she's stable, she has gone through a lot of therapies and a lot of work and nutrition programs and everything, but she has turned around and she's someone completely independent who has re-entered society and uh, has been able to forgive everything because there is an element of that as well for you to be able to move forward. No? If you just dwell in everything that happened, you know, you will not move forward. So she was able to actually put that behind. It was horrible. But life has given me a new chance, a new opportunity, and she has embraced that, and she's absolutely amazing. Um, another story that I, I, it's quite sad as well, is a young girl who, she was on a sports trip. So it's a middle-class girl, uh, sports trip with her school, and she was sold by her own coach. So that one could, could hit home. Very beautiful girl, sporty girl. And he managed to sell her into a brothel in one of the strips. So the girl disappeared and she was actually sold uh, by her own coach. Oh, so that, that does it was hit a, home, just a, it? A, does hit yeah. home. It was, it was a trip. And again, the parents completely trusting the school and the coach who she has been training with quite a long time. Uh, of course, it took a long time for them to find out that was actually the coach. I mean, it's a long story. But to make it short, again, she was uh, sold not once but twice, or actually three times into different brothels. It took years, you know, for, for her to be rescued again. So this is a story we know now because now she has been, you know, with us in the foundation for quite a few years. Again, amazing turning back. She finished school. Uh, she wanted to finish 
she graduated very well from high school and again got a job and her plan is to actually go to university and become a lawyer mm -hmm. I mean, this girl is absolutely amazing. So, I mean, like that, we've got a lot of stories. And I, I feel that that is, that is the positive oh, yeah. side of all this, yeah. is that, you know, the belief. But I, I would like to say that this is not a, a quick turnaround, as I'm sure people who are listening would imagine. So that's why we, at the foundation, we believe in the long-term rehabilitation. So I know there are some organizations that engage for a very short time. And that might be good to host a shelter for a short time if someone needs help once they're rescued. But the truth is rehabilitation only comes with a lot of love and a lot of structured programs and uh, a lot of time spent with the individual needs of that person. And I think that's what we do. So we don't have uh, thousands of girls in our program. We have dozens every year so a few dozen so we run for example in india three safe houses each safe house has 15 girls so it's not a huge impressive number but the reason why i say that is because it's a very personal there is the personal touch we know who that survivor is we know the story we know the needs and then we allow that transformation to happen in a period of two maybe three years so, but then of course there is a cost involved in that where you, we pay for everything, accommodation, clothing, nutrition, therapies, and then all the vocational courses as well, because then, you know, for you to become someone, you know, you in life training. and be able to yeah. actually take a job, you will require training. So we pay for all this, but we think it's worth it because then we know for sure that the person will not fall into a trap again. Mm. You know, it's fully empowered you know, fully aware and, you know, feeling physically well, mentally well, spiritually well, and ready to, to take a new and challenge. To help and others. that's what we see in our girls. Yeah. And to help others. And that's a good point, Liz, because we actually had a few girls that wanted to join the staff of the foundation, that's brilliant. Oh, <laughs> which I think is yeah. amazing because I think some, sometimes we would think, oh, I want to just move away as possible from all this. And yet some girls just felt like, you know what, I think I will be able to help so many girls if I actually join the, the foundation as staff. So they've become the new sort of uh, mothers and aunties of, you know, the Well, they're house. so connected, they're aren't they? Yeah, they, they would be the ones who would talk and, and ambassadors. note it. Ambassadors, oh, yeah, yeah for the program, really. What can we do then, you know, day to day? What, what should we be looking out for? And how would we report it if we, what are the distress signs? Well, on daily basis, I think there are quite a few signs that we can spot. I mean, the obvious are, are people who are maybe, especially in the society that we're talking about here in the UK, in the cities that we live, you know, people who are always with the same clothing, who are looking distressed, who are looking like there is something wrong. And I think, you know, there's a lot of intuition there too. Again, you know, I'm just saying some of these signs, but it, it, sometimes it's just the intuition. You're on a nail bar. Something is wrong. Something, someone is looking fearful. Someone might be able to, uh, to actually send you a sign, you know, and then you just need to be open for that. What's that hand um, sign that is now, what, you know, the, things, yeah, how do you do the hand sign that shows that you need to be rescued or that you're in distress? Do you know the one I mean? No, I actually don't. All right, don't. we're going to look that yeah, up. There's no this one. There's the phone, isn't it? If they phone, well, you can ask for a special drink at a bar, yeah. can't you? You can yeah. ask for Shelley, or, or yeah. and it means something. But we'll look those up and we'll put mm. that in the end. But there is a way yeah, of holding your hand. Where I know a girl recently, mm. um, it's it's like I think you put your thumb over your your palm, mm. and that's all it takes for them to understand that. Could you please phone for help? And that's maybe more and of a there, kidnapping thing, it, perhaps more than slavery. I, I may be wrong. Be, but also I think it's important for people to know about the helpline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, it's another link that is worth putting. The helpline is not a helpline that we, our organization, run, but it's the government uh, modern slavery helpline. And again, anybody can call and it can be an anonymous uh, call if you don't want to identify. And they will investigate even something. If you're not sure, it's worth calling anyways and mm -hmm. just give the address, say the situation. Situation, or you hear something funny happening in an apartment, in a house, 
is always with the curtain shut. There is always a movement of people in and out in strange hours. You know, that could be something. So even if you're not sure, you can just tell them and they will investigate and you're completely out of it. But I think it's worth it because it could save someone's lives. Yeah. You know? So that's in terms of spotting. But I think there are other things that we can do, you know, as individuals, if we want to get involved. And I think the first one is to inform yourself, of course, to read about it and to to know how to spot the signs and, you know, what the, the issues really are behind this problem of modern slavery. Um, but I think you can, you know, if you if you own a business, perhaps you, your business can have some sort of CSR program that can support organizations like you can free us. That's another way um, you can host talks, whether you're part of a club whether you're part of a business and then invite someone from organizations like you can free us to speak on the topic. And again, it can be very targeted to the specific industry and your specific business and the needs of your employees. Uh, what do, what would you like them to know about this problem? Um, of course, donations. I think, you know, at the end, I would love to say, but, you know, the website and people take note of that because without that, you cannot run the program. So that is the, the major thing. And again, on our website, we have, you know, you can donate directly to the issue of modern slavery or you can donate to modern slavery for the Ukrainian program specifically. And then we will honor that. And there will be a few other categories there as well. Um, so that that's probably some of the, the major things that people can do. Um, you can also volunteer. I think volunteer is another way. It's a bit tricky because you're dealing with people who, again, are very vulnerable. So not every organization will allow just any volunteer to come and talk to survivors. It is a bit tricky. But you can volunteer in different ways. You, you can raise uh, funds or you can raise awareness, you know. So there are other ways to, to contributing uh, with your voice and your talents. Would you just share with us the address for you for you can free us for the website? Yeah, address? so it's uh, www.youcanfreeusuk.org. So one more time, you can free us uk.org. That will take you directly to the UK version of you can free us because we're in different countries. So I think for people in the UK, that's probably the best one to go. Uh, you can also go on the Indian site and read some of the stories. We have a lot of uh, the testimonies online, very brave girls who, who have gone and faced the camera and decided to share the story because they know that that story, it's so powerful that can change the lives of other girls, you know. So I think that there are quite a few testimonies there that you can, you can also hear. Uh, our, our film, our short film, Switch, is also on the website. But again, we can put a link uh, somewhere afterwards, but you can also search Switch. You can free us on YouTube and you will see the little short 90 second film on uh, modern slavery. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time today and for everything you're doing. You. Incredible work. Yeah, I, I do fear for our kids going out into the world and, and you know, what they could come across. But I'm really glad that we can have a chance to raise awareness to we educate them a edu little bit, you know, a little bit at a time. Yeah. But, yeah, but if you think about it, I think every generation has had its own evil. I like to say that this is probably mm -hmm. the most pressing social uh, problem of our times. You know, it is horrendous, but every generation would have had to, you know, to deal with different issues. I think this is probably the one mm -hmm. our generation is dealing with. And let's hope that our children yeah. will be able to, to, finish it to end it now in their time mm. perfect yeah. thank you Clarissa. thank you very much so for much. the opportunity thank you bye bye thank you bye bye oh my god that's so scary <sighs> i'm shocked i'm really shocked I'm bit, at just I'm... how massive it is across the world I was about to say I'm speechless, and I was going to say about you not being you know, never speechless, but you have you, you can see on your face you are a bit. Well, listen to how during the interview we just let Clarissa speak, really, because it's There's... well we're no experts at all. But I mean, I was just I was a bit. You're right. I was gobsmacked yeah. and horrified. I, was just, I think you know we're saying about the kids being naive. I think I am. No, I'm just as naive, really. I think I I've always taught my kids to trust their gut. 
you know, I think I mentioned spidey sense before, but trust that, you know, the hackles on the back of your neck, if you think something's not right, chances are it's not right. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's easy, that's easier said than done when they're looking for a job and, you know, they want it. They might just not see the, the red flags because I know I've been in that situation before. Not not obviously the situation about yeah. um, modern slavery, but situations where I know they're perhaps not, it's not right, but you keep going because you have to. You think, you know. Well, do you know, it, it was very different when we were first at work in our 20s and 30s yeah. and 40s, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a different generation and, you know, there would be... Well, there wasn't really the internet. Big, you know, you had to meet people face to face. And okay, you're saying about, you know, flying, you wouldn't fly halfway around the world normally to meet someone when it's the first, the first sort of meeting. You, 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 that doesn't make sense, does it first? You know what I mean? You, yeah. you, you it just was different. Mm. I'm not explaining that well at all, but I know what I mean. We didn't, we didn't actually do that much traveling. We're probably just a bit more global, I suppose, in our thinking now. Now we are, but we weren't yeah. when we, you've got to put, put yourself back to when you're 18. But you've also got to be quite, brave haven't you if you see somebody that you think um could be a victim to speak up yeah i mean i'd rather speak up and be damned than to be to ignore it and let somebody well i think the thing is now there's there's all these organizations you can contact them yeah so i looked up that um distress signal you know the hand oh, thing. Yeah, yeah that's from tiktok so oh. somebody invented that and so you hold your open palm and then you Put your four other fingers over your thumb. So it's almost like like, like you're about to punch, but then you hold it upright. Mm -hmm. So um, the foundation apparently created it as a way for victims of abuse to discreetly ask for help on a video call, oh, especially during yeah. COVID-19, during the lockdowns. And there was this, obviously, there was that big, horrible surge in domestic violence. Mm -hmm. But that's, and I know that there was one girl, NPR reported on this, about she was... Um, she was rescued from a car after a driver saw her use the signal. Well, I suppose you could. If you're sitting in the back seat, the driver wouldn't see and someone's taking you. That you could yeah, do it. or at yeah. a bar or yeah. wherever you are. So, yeah, so you close your four fingers over your thumb and it's like a fist, but it's not almost like you're taking the pledge. Okay. A bit like that. We should put that on Instagram. Yeah, let's do that. Because yeah. I, I learned that today. I mean, I wouldn't have known anything about that before. I know. We should, and we should tell our daughters but, yeah. as well, because the more that gets known, the more that will be internationally recognised. Yeah. So there's, there is that nail varnish and it detects a spiked drink. And, uh, you can Where find can that. You can get it on the internet. Oh my God. They do it on Amazon. Hmm. Why won't Amazon sponsor us? We mentioned them so <laughs> much. Need, it's just a number of parcels that arrive. Right. Yeah. You just need a loading bay, actually, I think. <laughs> Undercovercolors.com. Okay, okay. So, yeah. listeners. Mm. Yeah. I'm, I'm keep meaning to get that for my, for my girls, actually. Mm. But you've got to take these little steps that um, you can add to your arsenal. It's our weaponry against being vulnerable. Like that, yeah. As Clarissa so that's for said, spiking, isn't it? It's about yeah. vulnerability. Yeah, for spiking drinks, mm. huge surge in that. Yeah. I think the best thing that we can do is take from this that there is hope, as Clarissa said. Yeah. You know, look out for the signs, see where you can help, and and, and, we, and we are raising where if it's like Emma Thompson says, it's just uh, if you you can do something, it's only little bits that you can do, and it is true. We feel that it's all somewhere else it's not in your home country but we live in the uk mm. and it's here right on our doorsteps as clarissa said did you listen to the floodlight podcast with yeah. princess eugenie you. and i listened to the one with emma thompson and she said she was horrified that um just in the massage parlor down the road from her that was a hotbed mm. for yeah. modern slavery and how shocking was that so it's yeah just, it's people like emma thompson she's advocating and she just a little bit of awareness. Yeah. We can't change it overnight. But, but we the can more we something. know and the, the more, more we're aware we of it, it, then, yeah. Thanks, Emma, and thanks, Eugenie. <laughs> yeah. So, a bit of a sombre topic this time, yeah. but I think it's one that you have to talk have about. have to talk about, because as I said to you before, I didn't think it was going to be, well, you know, how is it relevant to midlife, you know, ups and downs of our lives? But, but it's it so relevant you know, I just, it, you know, it's hit me in the face now that how relevant it is to my life and to my, my family's life. Yeah, I know. Literally, before before we were going to do this interview, Liz said, why? Yeah. <laughs> why, why is that relevant to us? Well, that said, it, but it is. You know, yeah. I had that scary thing with Flissy. I never thought it would come into our lives because, mm. you know, we think we're educated, we're careful and, you know, but it can affect anybody anywhere. And this is not meant to be like a scary no, I think thing. that's it. That's what, you know, we're trying to be positive about this. This is but reality. It's reality. 
we know it exists. We can't turn a blind eye, which I think it's, it's, it's tempting to do because we don't think it's happening on our doorstep. And we don't think as an individual we can make a difference. Yeah. But we can. We can a lot. We can, we can a lot. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I think next episode... We'll go up. <laughs> that was a down. No, it wasn't a down. No, it, it was, wasn't. It was, it was a real. A, it, was, it was a real. It was reality. It was, it's very educating now. Mm. And that's why I love doing these podcasts because yeah. I'm learning so much. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to bring episode to you next time that's um, well, more uplifting, more upbeat. More more upbeat. upbeat. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it's important we talked about this. And it does make my whinging about my diet and diet, plural, my many diets. Um, just very insignificant. But I'm going to take care of that with another juicing diet. I'm going to do the juiced and squeezed diet for a couple of days and I'm going to try and do that maybe every other week. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to do that as well. Yeah, we'll do it with I'm me. Gonna wait. Well, as you know, I'm off to Cornwall next week, my exotic holiday compared to your... <laughs> <laughs> you should make your children live abroad and then you have to go and visit them. It's a bit extreme. <laughs> so juice and squeeze. Yeah, I love that name. <laughs> Yeah, I know look, it works. You, do, you, do, you look good. Well, yeah. I know it works for me, so I'm I'm going to be good again. I says I'm going to have a go at it, but I get so hungry. No, you, you won't. Don't. No, I have the nut milk, and it's all right. It's no, it, it is. Yeah, and like I said, I put vodka in it last time, <laughs> <laughs> but I won't do that this time. No, yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll be back on the couch in a week or two, won't we? Bye. Bye. Wouldn't you just know it? I had just finished editing this episode, and I was about to get it ready for upload. And absolute serendipity, I was at the Chelsea Flower Show preview evening and I was introduced to BAFTA award-winning director and documentarian Kate Blewett. She's a documentary producer, director, presenter, and she did this incredible film. It was the winner of the Peabody Award and it's still very relevant even a couple of decades later. It's called Slavery, a global investigation, and it was a True Vision production. This film exposed slavery in the rug-making sector of northwest India, the cocoa plantations in the Ivory Coast, and even the home of a World Bank official in Washington, D.C. So small personal stories of slavery were woven together to tell the much larger story of slavery in the global economy. And she very kindly recorded this for us. Have a listen. My name is Kate Blewett and I'm a television documentary filmmaker. I've been making films on social issues, very often global social issues, um, that have a huge impact on many people's lives and are often hidden away. And each film I make is made with a very specific sense of purpose for the need for change, a real urgent need for change. And I made a film called Slavery, which was a global investigation into modern day slavery around the world. And I witnessed really very, very deeply shocking examples of men, women and children who were being extensively trafficked and um, put into slavery. And when I say slavery, I'm not talking about a modern day definition of slavery. I'm talking about slavery as we have always known it. And that is when somebody is taken with force, kept against their will and paid absolutely zero for their work. Um, it is shocking to think that in this day and age, we have millions. I mean, the estimates vary and whilst the figure of 40 million is a figure that is used a great deal amongst organizations today when referring to the number of slaves we have today. I think the chances are it's much higher than that by the very fact that it is um, an invisible thing to many um, people who are trafficked and put into slavery are most of the time hidden away or when they are seen working in different environments, they are not known as slaves because um, they live with fear, they don't speak out, they can't, they have no freedom of movement. Uh, so it's a very, very uh, hidden, miserable, unacceptable thing that goes on extensively across the world today. Um, it's shocking really that we have more slaves today than ever before. Thanks 
for listening to Two Women Chatting with our special guests. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean the world to us if you left a rating and review. Even better, share with your friends. And please get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. There's a link on our Instagram bio and Facebook pages. 